morning, everyone. Good to be back at home this morning, and uh, appreciate my substitute last Sunday taking care of the lesson for me. Sometimes uh, we have opportunities that come our way last minute. Can't always do it, but I was able to last Sunday to go and uh, minister to uh, preach it brother for Brother Garnett Pullum, Pastor Appreciation Day. And uh, I want us to pray for that church and those good people. I'm telling you, it done me so much good to be able to make greater acquaintance with them and and uh, be a part of that. And the Lord helped us, and I really appreciate it. And uh, I do want to say, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure they'll tell you at some point, but on behalf of Landon and Mary, I really appreciate everyone who reached out and uh, helped them and prayed for them. And Mary and her family still need a lot of prayer. They will right on. And so please keep them in prayer. They, she is back home this morning, and he just communicated with her. She went back to stay with her mother a few days, and, and uh, it's just a big, a big change. And uh, we told, used to tell folks when I was pastoring and somebody passed away, one of the things that we, I guess it was an attempt to comfort the family. You know, people have wondered how they'd go on and, how life would be, and you know like I do that after a while you develop a new normal and uh, you go on with life, and God helps you through that, and I appreciate everybody praying for them. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's go to the book of Hebrews this morning. I want to talk to us lesson today is the path of the pursuer. How many of you know that, that living for God is a constant pursuit? It's a constant quest. We are... Uh, we are in constant uh, forward motion. At least we should be. If we live for God the way that we should, it should be an upward mobility, a constant pressing forward in our walk with God. Hebrews chapter 5, in the last uh, four verses there, the scripture tells us, Paul is writing and he's telling those people, he said in verse 12, for, when, uh, for the time ye ought to be teachers, you should be able to teach, he said. Instead, you have need that one teach you again. Now, that word again speaks volumes right there because in other words, they've already heard this doctrine that he's teaching. He said, you have need, you should be able to teach it yourself. But instead of that, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. That word unskillful means inexperienced. He hath no experience, is what the marginal reading of my Bible said. Verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You need to grow up in the Lord. You need to grow up in the Lord. One man said, I don't mind giving a bottle to babies, but when you have to part the mustache to get the bottle in your mouth, there's a serious problem somewhere. Y'all know that to be true. <laughs> and uh, one man uh, was so outdone with his church, and I won't call the name because I'm not sure if it was him or his brother that done it. But uh, I think they're both preachers and pastors, and he was so outdone with his congregation. He had a butter dish, I think, on his communion table full of pacifiers. And uh, at one point he was so outdone, he just took that thing and just slung those pacifiers out over that congregation and said, come on, you bunch of babies. That's what you want anyway since pacifiers. Well, that's a little extreme to me, but you know we've all felt that about people. 
mighty quiet right now, but you know we've all felt that about people. They need to grow up in the Lord. And so what Paul is saying here, you should be able to teach yourself. But instead of you teaching, I'm still have, folks still having to teach you and, and you're not even able to take the meat of the word. Uh, you ever heard people talk about, I wish preachers today would name sin. They couldn't take it if he did because the sin that they won't name is other people's sins, not theirs. And uh, the sin that they won't dealt with is somebody, it's what they think is what's wrong. And so Paul is dealing with this here, and he said you need to be able to take the meat, and you can only do that if you've grown. Now, I would not dare give my granddaughter a, 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 a three-quarter inch piece of T-bone <clears throat> or a ribeye, even as tender as I like them. Cut them with a fork tender. I mean melt in your mouth. I wouldn't give it to her. Because of what she is, she's a baby. She's got to grow into that. And you need not expect new babes in Christ to be able to take the sincere meat of the word and those who are not experienced and skillful in the word to accept those things. There are times you have to feed milk. You have to do it. And, and sometimes you got to break what you feed them down to, spiritually speaking, you got to break it down so that they can receive it. But as they grow, and they should grow, if they were, if it works like it's supposed to, we pursue greater things in God, and we grow into greater things in God. And so, in in the original writing of our Bible, our scriptures, there was no chapter and verse. So, this continues. Paul said, "Be strong, meat belongs to them that are full age, and even by who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil." And then he said, therefore, chapter 6, verse 1, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us do what? Go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And that's not a period there. That is a comma. Of the, and he continues, so he continues of the doctrine of, of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. What he's saying is, don't keep going back to those things. This scripture right here knocks it in the head, those people and the, the, the idea of being in and out, up and down, start and stop, thrust and pull back. You know, it takes it, it, it knocks that out right there, shoots it out of the saddle. He said, you can't keep going back to these doctrines, you know, and 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 just going back to the doctrines of the principles of things. He said, but we've got to move on. And verse three said, and this will we do if God permit. Go on into perfection. This we will do if God will permit. How many of you believe God will permit, permit you to grow? I believe that this morning. It's the will of God that we grow. Now, this is just the starting place today, and I hope the Lord will help us with this because this is what I feel on my heart. Chapter number 12 of Hebrews, very quoted scripture, and verse number 12, wherefore, uh, chapter 12 and verse 12 of Hebrews, wherefore, Lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 12 tells us that in our walk in our, in our pursuit of God, we are to be helpful. I got three, three points right here, three verses. Verse 12 teaches us to be helpful. Lift up the hands which hang down, right? And, and, and the feeble knees. I like to use the word strengthen there. In other words, offer strength to your brother. Be helpful. And in verse 13, make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it be rather be healed. There's helpful and there's a healing way. And then in verse 14, 
we have the holy way. We've got a helpful way, a healing way, and a holy way. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, that word follow there is not a passive word. It's not a maybe I will, maybe I won't word. But in its, in its uh, usage here in this scripture, it is an imperative word. Brother W.H. Wyatt said it is likened to a drill sergeant or a platoon leader in the military who giving orders to his men, he says, forward, march. They probably do it a lot better than I do. But for an illustration purpose, he just says, march. And the emphasis on that word is, you march until I tell you to stop. And that is the same usage of this word follow. Not passive, maybe, maybe not, but imperative. It's necessary. He said, follow. We could say it like a drill sergeant. Follow. And we are told to follow until God says for us to stop. And I can read this Bible from cover to cover. And I never read where we are to stop pursuing holiness and peace with all men. Now, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the pursuit is, is the holiness of God. It is the goal of living and being Christ-like. Ultimately, the goal is heaven. And whenever we look at the pursuit of holiness, there are arguments in this world from people who do not believe that you can be holy. They don't believe that it's necessary for you to strive to live and do your best. You know what their, their number one excuse is? Nobody's perfect. You know, and, they'll, and they're witnesses and, and, and it's such a weak argument. Just say, uh, Brother Matt, it's just a just simple carnal example here. He don't mind me using him. Brother Matt's wearing a, a is that a blue coat? Wouldn't you say that's blue? Well, brother Matt, I don't think it's right for you to for you to wear a blue a blue blue color. But don't don't you know I'm not perfect now. You see, I'm not perfect. I, now don't don't judge me. And I, I know I need to do better. I got on blue too. But, but you know I really think you ought not to do that. How weak is that? How weak is that? That's frail. It's not going to stand up. And so what people are telling you today and the general consensus of society and even the church world is that holiness is not attainable. But I believe it is. I believe it is. And it's not necessarily only the outward appearance, but first, first, before the outward appearance is that inward man of the heart that through prayer and seeking and the sanctification by the blood, by the word, and by the Holy Ghost, God gives us that. And we are to attain unto the holiness of God. Holiness is Christ's likeness. When we, when, we, when we bear the image, if we want to bear the image of the heavenly, we must bear the image of the earthly, which is our earthly man. But therein also we must bear the image of our heavenly father or be like Christ. We're to pursue after that. And if we are to pursue after that, let me let me go back. Let me think. See, I don't remember exactly where it was, but you remember when the some of the people questioned Jesus about paying taxes, and he said, "Bring me a coin or a penny or whatever it is." And he said, "Whose image is on that?" And they said, "Caesar's." Right? You remember that? Jesus said, "Caesar." They said, "Caesar's." He said, "Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's." Now, whose image are you to bear? Huh? Christ, God's image. Give to God what is God's. That's, that's been a problem for a lot of people whenever to teaching and preaching, especially on the outward appearance and, and dealing with the, 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 I guess, the touchy issues of the heart, envy and malice and lust and gossip and, yeah, all that. When you start dealing with that, folks get kind of want to, as they say, crawl that on you. It's like the one woman I've told you till it's threadbare. The one woman went to hear some preacher preach, and boy, I mean, he was preaching. And she went home and told her husband just those very words. Said, I'm telling you, honey, you got to come hear him. Said, he's the preachingest man ever since preachers 
started preaching. Said, "Come hear him." And so they went, and uh, he got up and he said, "He said, uh, you women." And this is back in the day when everybody had a little garden, you know. He said, you women been sneaking in their neighbor's garden, stealing them green beans and them cabbage heads. He said, you're going to burn in hell for that. And she nudged her husband and said, boy, I told you you could preach. And directly got to preach and said, you long-tongued gossiping women standing at the back fence gossiping about your neighbor, running everybody in the neighborhood down. She said, come on, honey, we got to get out of here. Said he done quit preaching and gone to meddling. Well, that's the way the folks are nowadays. Anything that touches directly on them, they want to pass it aside and throw it to someone else. But whenever we begin to look at what the scripture said, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. I belong to Christ. I must conduct myself like a Christian. There's some things you cannot wear, things you cannot say, feelings you cannot harbor if you bear the image of Christ. Brother L.L. Collins said he had a hat when he was pastoring at the Highway of Holiness and they, they got some hats with a church name on it, maybe some coach, kind of like we got shirts, you know, and he said I, I had on he said I had on one of those hats that said Pentecost the Highway of Holiness. And he said I went in a place of business. He said I wasn't just a few feet inside the door and I realized I don't need to be here. This place I don't need to be. And he didn't know what it was or he wouldn't have never been in there. He said, but I realize this is not a good testimony. And he said, when I come back out the door, he said, I thought, boy, I'm glad they see me leaving and not staying wearing this highway of hole in his hat. It was a testimony. He was afraid somebody would see him there. And I'll tell you something. If you can't, I know sometimes things, you know, get, get told that's not true. One man said he had bought him a, it was back whenever prepaid phone cards were real popular, and he'd bought him a prepaid phone card and a root beer, and somebody saw him with it, and they said he's got him a six-pack and a scratch-off, is what they said. And it, the rumors went out, and I could tell you who that was. You'd really get a kick out of it then. And a six-pack and a scratch-off, you know. And all it was was a root beer and a scratch-off phone card, you know. And I know that people, and I'm going to tell you, when folks want to find fault with you, they'll find fault with you. But, but and you know, it's kind of like this. We know offenses will come, but woe to them by whom they come. You know, Paul said, if you're going to suffer, suffer uh, for doing good, not as an evildoer. And so, uh, you know, you, you can't please everybody, but I'll tell you one thing we can do. We can please God. And we should pursue that. We should pursue pleasing God. Now, let's go to the book of Philippians. And uh, we're going to try to get as much into this today as possible because there's a character study I want to throw in here if I can uh, a little later on. But let's go to the book of Philippians, chapter number 3. Paul said in verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. I'm going to read this slow so I can get it. I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, what does he do? He said, I press, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded and if in anything you be otherwise minded God shall reveal even this unto you. The apostle Paul is, is telling and testifying here of his own experience with God. And what he's basically saying, just a simple way of putting it that I, that I feel like is, is correct, is he says, I know that I am not the man I used to be. How many of you would, would, could see the change in Apostle Paul? This man that, that had Christians killed. What a drastic change had come into his life. The, 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 one, the, the way and the, the doctrine he weren't persecuted, now he's preaching it. A total 180 degree, degree turnaround from what he was. And he said, I know that I'm not what I was. But he said, I don't think that I have arrived, but I am still in pursuit. 
And I, I've often thought, you know, sometimes we say, and I, I used to tell folks sometimes I'm not as high on the totem pole as I want to be, but I'm still climbing. How many of you know that this morning? We're still climbing. We're still pursuing. Brother, brother uh, uh, Roy Gaskins preached in his late 80s and early 90s, preached at the uh, associational conference. And in that message, I remember him talking about how that even a man of his ripe old age still fought the devil and still had to, to deal with temptations of the flesh and, and, and the spirits of the flesh. And, and, and you, see, you see, that doesn't change because you get mature. As long as, and I'll tell you something, years ago my wife said that Brother Denville, in his teaching of the class, he would tell them, as long as you are in this body, you're going to have to deal with the flesh. You're going to have to deal with the things of the flesh. You can become so heavenly minded. I've seen people that, that they were just so heavenly minded, but you cross them and you had to fight them. Something's wrong there. Now, I ain't saying you got to lay down and be a doormat or be nobody's dog, but I'm going to tell you something. There's something about having a right spirit. Well, I forget, I forget what the, who the man was, but many years ago, I think Sonny Griswold was telling me about a biography he'd read of some preacher and they had some, they had some riffraff causing trouble in the church and he just wrote it down in his biography. He said, fortunately for us, thank God we had a few good men that knew how to use their fist and, you know, it just went right on and they just had to deal with the problem. I'm not for that. I don't expect you to be a dog, but I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes whenever, whenever you get to, to, to dealing with people and dealing with the flesh, you got to have some kind of an out. But God said, and God speaks to us through his word and teaches us to have a Christ-likeness about us. Now, we're told in the scripture to provide for our own. Any man that don't provide is the same as an infidel. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not just food and raiment. That's protection as well. I don't want to get caught out on a tangent here but I'm just simply teaching us that we are to pursue godliness. That's the reason the apostle said, as much as it's possible, live peaceably with all men. And how many of you know there's some people you just can't live peaceably with them? You know what I have to do to folks like that? I try to stay away from them. Let them go on, let them go on and do what they're going to do because you can't change them. And dust your feet off and move on. But Paul said, I'm not so arrogant as to think that I have got all the answers in my bag. He said, I'm not so arrogant as to think that I have attained unto everything that I should attain. But he said, I have been apprehended by Christ. In other words, I have been arrested. I have been taken in. This thing has got a hold of me and I'm doing my best to get a hold of it and to hang on to it. And through this, I'm going to press toward the mark. What is that mark? For the prize of the high calling of God through Christ or in Christ Jesus. Now, when we begin to look at this, that word high calling could be translated in saying upward. I'm going to press upward towards God, toward Christ. I think we all know that the only true and correct and accurate direction for a Christian to go is upward mobility, constantly climbing. We're taught in the word of God. I could take you back, and I don't have time to do it this morning, but I could take you back to the word of God and teach you that, and, and tell you how that we are to be in constant pursuit. We are to run faster. We are to go farther. We are to, we are to pursue, climb higher, you know, through the, and, and dig deeper as it were. And uh, it's kind of like the, you can, you can get a little confused there if you're carnal minded. It's like the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is referred to as wind, water, fire, oil, a whole, probably a whole bunch of other things. And so you say, well, what is it? Is it wind, oil, fire, water? It, yes. Yes, it is all of those things. And so when we're pursuing Christ and pursuing the way of holiness, do we climb higher? Do we dig deeper? Do we fly higher? Do we run faster? Yes. Yes. The bottom line is you never stop pursuing Christ. You never stop pursuing the way of holiness. If you want to attain holiness in your life, it's not, and I'm going to say this, and I know it's going out, and I may get kicked back for it, 
But holiness is not only about shucking off the appearance of the world and abstaining from the appearance of evil. Holiness is the nature of God. And it is imparted to us through the study of the word of God. Listening to him. And through the work of the spirit in our life. And probably more importantly than anything else, it is imparted to us through prayer and spending time in the presence of God. We are to be followers of God as dear children. We are to be imitators of Christ. You remember the story, and, and I know it became a, I think it became a movie, but be that as it may, the first book I ever had a preacher give to me incidentally I've still got it I have purposely not traded it and purposely not sold it but I have the first book brother Billy Joe Watson ever gave me first time a preacher ever gave me a book and it was an old hardcover copy of Charles M. Sheldon's In His Steps What Would Jesus Do? I didn't know who Charles Sheldon was since then I've read a lot of his books have several of them I've got a very rare edition of what's called Dr. Sheldon's scrapbook. And it's, it's, there's only a handful that I know of anywhere. I'm sure they're out there. People just don't know what they got. But when I finally managed to find one and got it, I knew of only seven copies at all, and I'd only seen one. And so I put out the APB. I told Switzer, he was evangelizing at the time. I told Brother Mike Switzer, I said, you find it for me, and I'll double your money back on it. And uh, I told several preachers that because they had access to a lot of travel. Anyway, the first book that he, Brother Bill ever gave, to, gave to me was In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And if you've ever read the story, that's exactly what it is. It's a man who took the vow and took it upon himself to think about every situation, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And so, uh, uh, you know, when we go through life, wouldn't that be... Wouldn't that be an enlightening way to look at things, to think, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would he react in this situation? Well, I keep seeing, I keep seeing this little uh, picture, and it shows a picture of Jesus with a whip overturning tables, and running, running the money makers and the money changers out of the, out of the temple. And they said, sometimes Jesus does this. Well, sometimes he does. But that's really not the point of the matter. It's not about choosing to do the wrath of God as much as it is choosing to be an imitator of Christ Jesus in our life. I want to imitate him. I want to pursue after him. We all should. Amen. And so now, as we go to, uh, as we go to a little further in the lesson, I want to get in, and I don't have much time to do it. We may have to make two Sundays out of this. The, the path of the pursuer. The path of the pursuer is not one of ease. It is not one, the trail that a, a man must, must go on to pursue the things of God. It is not one that is easy to travel. It brings deprivation. Sometimes it brings uh, 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 being uh, ostracized by family and friends. Sometimes it, it brings about hardship. Sometimes it brings about hard feelings to carnal-minded people. But it is, it is the will of God that we continually climb higher, as I mentioned, dig deeper, run faster, do everything that we can to attain to the holiness of God, realizing that it is attainable. It can be had. And so we have to look sometimes uh, at people will look and they'll say, well, you don't seem very holy or you holier than thou. But we are not in the pursuit of pleasing people. We are to have a good testimony. But when it comes to being faultless and blameless, you never will be in the eyes of people. The Bible teaches us that a bishop and a deacon should be blameless. But as good a man as our pastor is, there's people that don't like him. And he agrees. <laughs> as, as, as good as, as our congregation is, there are people that don't like some of us. Does that make us sinners? No. But that just goes to prove the fact that in the eyes of man, you can never be blameless. But in the eyes of God, you can be blameless because he looks in a different way than man does. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament. There's a character here 
I want to talk about for just a few minutes and uh, <clears throat> maybe try to insert this little character study here. There's a man who pursued something in the Old Testament from, from the time he was uh, just a young man until he was in his uh, well stricken of age according to the Hebrew way of looking at age. You know, certain age you were, you were the beginning of old age and after you reached 80, 85 years old, 80 or 85, you became what's called well stricken in age. This man was 85 years old. Most of you know who I'm talking about already. His name was Caleb. Do you know what he was? He was a man that could match the mountain. Whenever he was given a promise as a young man, the Bible tells of how that he was among those spies that went out to look uh, <coughs> in Canaan and he was there and saw the things that happened. I was reading this morning uh, at the brook Eshkol where that they brought back from the spying out of the land. You know, they said they, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. All those 12 spies came back and uh, they said in verse 23 of chapter uh, 13, that they came to uh, uh, the brook Eshkel and they cut down a, a cluster of grapes and it was so big until they had to put a staff between two men. Two men basically carried it on their shoulder and that cluster of grapes was so big. I've seen you know, the artist depiction of that. You just imagine that? Two men carrying a cluster of grapes. It was so big that one man couldn't carry it and so they strung it up on a staff between them and, and they, and they, here they brought that back. They brought those pomegranates from the sea. And, and they came to Moses and Aaron and, and they brought back word unto them and showed them the fruit of the land. And the verse 27 said, and told him and said, we came to the land that, that, and it does, it really does flow with milk and honey. I'm just going to paraphrase this as we go through it uh, real quick here. And, and said, look at this fruit. It flows with milk and honey and look at these grapes. Look at these pomegranates. And, 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 and I'm telling you, and they said, but nevertheless, uh-oh, there's a bump in the road. Chapter 13 of, of Numbers and verse number 28, nevertheless, the people are strong and the cities have walls and there's giants there. I got a feeling it was those 10 doubtful spies, you know, the majority, the miserable majority, I call them. But then there were two men, Joshua and Caleb. They weren't part of the miserable majority. I call them part of the magnificent minority. Amen. And so the Bible said, doesn't mention Joshua here, but in verse 30, there's only one man who's given recognition. And the Bible said, and Caleb stilled the people. Shh. That's basically what the, what the word means. He hushed the people. Stop your crying, wipe your tears, and listen to me. Calm down and let me tell you something. And the Bible said that he stilled the people, and he said, let's go right now. Right now. He said, let us go up at once and possess it. In other words, right now. If we will go right now, God will give us power to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we're not able to go. They're great. They're stronger than we are. The Bible said in verse 32 that they brought an evil report. They had bad news. Always bad news. Somebody's always going to be have negativity to offer to, to trying to pursue after the things of God. And so they brought up an evil report of the land that they had searched unto the children of Israel. And they said, we, we, it's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. If you'll notice that once they got their foothold into the conversation, they had nothing good to say. It eats up the inhabitants, and the people we saw are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which which came to the uh, which came of the giants, and we we looked like grasshoppers in our own sight. We looked like grasshoppers in their sight. But you know what happened? God was not pleased with that. He was not pleased with their doubt because their doubt was contagious. It spread throughout the entire congregation. And the Bible said, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. And then they'd done what folks usually do when they get discontented. They turned on their leaders. Hmm? They turned on their leaders. 
They murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt. Would God we had died in the wilderness. The Lord brought us out here into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a, a, a prey. And so all they had was complaints against pursuit. Do you know why most of us don't want to pursue? Because it breaks us out of our comfort zone. That's my problem. <laughs> Let me just be transparent here. That's my problem. Whenever I find myself not wanting to pursue the things of God or wanting to be slack about this, you know what you have to do at a time like that? You got to focus your mind and say, I got to get this done. This is more important than anything else right now. More important than the daily task. More important than the things on my mind. I got to focus my mind and my heart on God. And so Joshua and particularly Caleb tried his best to get them to pursue. And I'm going to have to conclude this here and take it up again next Sunday, Lord willing. But I want to tell us something here. The people died in the wilderness. You know what they said? Would God we had died back in Egypt. You brought us out here to be, to, to be killed with a sword. I'd like to say this. Be careful what you say, children of Israel, because that's exactly what happened. They said, we're going to die in this wilderness. We're going to die right here. They got what they wished for because before this chapter is over, God says to them, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And the ones that you say that you're worried about, those children that you say that you're worried about, they're the ones that's going to possess the promises. They're the ones that's going to possess the things that I promised to them. The little ones which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in. They shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, you doubters, as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and shall be wasted in the wilderness. God was not well pleased with them, but in the midst of all of that, he said, I'm going to award two men, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He said, my servant. Why? Because he had another spirit about him, and he wholly followed God. Does anybody here remember the other 10 spies' names? Hmm? But we know who the two were, don't we? Joshua and Caleb, that magnificent minority who stood up. And, I, and I, I plan to teach some more about Joshua. Joshua was not a man that was forward in his position, but he had to constantly be encouraged, be strong and of a good courage. You read the first couple of chapters of Joshua, the Lord was repeatedly saying to him, be strong and of a good, good courage. Be, be brave, be strong and of a good courage over and over. But Caleb, we never see where he wavered in his resolve, he wavered in his courage or any of it. And we're going to talk more about him, Lord willing, next Sunday because it's a quarter till and I promise to put myself on a time diet and not go over so much as I've been known to do. But I want to tell you, we've got to pursue after the things of God. You know, there's some things that God has promised some people and because of time and because of disappointments, because of the cares of this life, they've allowed those promises to fade into the background. I just this year, or just recently when I was at Summit, I saw Brother Earl again, Brother Edmonds, I think is his name. And uh, 20 or 30 years ago, Steve Gentry prophesied that they'd have a, they'd have a baby. Some of y'all know the story. And uh, they were in there. Do y'all remember how, was it, how many, how old were they? Late 40s, early 50s. 20 or 30 years ago, Steve Gentry prophesied that they'd have a baby. 20 or 30 years ago. Brother Earl come in this year and he's carrying that baby. She's, she's a little girl now, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it was a little girl, wasn't it? He's carrying it. She's, she's walking, and, you know. And here this man like Abraham and Sarah almost got this baby. He said, you know, they call Steve Gentry a false prophet because it took so long. But God said he was going to do it. And God did it. They brought the newspaper out, I think, and had an article wrote about them, this older couple that had this baby. 
because they kept pursuing and kept believing. I want to tell you something, friend. When God promises it, he'll bring it to pass, won't he? So let's continually pursue. God promised us salvation. Let's pursue it. God promised us the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let's go after it. God promises that we could obtain the holiness of God in our life and be a holy people. Let's pursue it. May God bless you this morning.